Tonight, after two weeks of blockades of trains ground to a halt, the Prime Minister says enough is enough. The barricades must now come down. And calls on Indigenous leaders to end the stalemate. So, what happens now? And another standoff, this one at Ontario schools. No education cut! Leaving two million kids out of class. Is the Weinstein jury deadlocked and what the jurors' question reveals about a possible verdict? Getting counterfeit goods off the shelves? Is this real? No, 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 how many? Why your knockoff could be supporting criminal activity. When you file the money, it gets really scary. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Susan Ormiston. Ian is away tonight. Justin Trudeau says the rail blockades damaging the economy and disrupting daily lives must come down. And that's after days of calling for patience and dialogue. But it is unclear what happens next. Trudeau still insists the government can't order police action and so far police haven't moved. Remember, this all began about two weeks ago when RCMP in British Columbia began to enforce an injunction to clear out protest camps on Wet'suwet'en territory so construction of a natural gas pipeline could resume. Around 80 people were arrested and the backlash has ground Canada's rail system to a halt. Salima Shivji begins our coverage tonight with the government's change in tone and how that's playing with their critics. A high-level meeting in a high-pressure situation. We know we've still got a great deal of work to do. We're doing that work. For days now, the government has tried to use dialogue to remove illegal blockades like this one in Quebec. Where residents argued with protesters who've ignored a court order to leave. I feel like I'm an hostages. Patience has also run out in Ottawa. Unacceptable and untenable. Justin Trudeau admitting his push for talks with the Wet'suwet'en chiefs has failed. We can't have dialogue when only one party is coming to the table. It's a sharp change in tone. Legally. In this case, the injunctions must be obeyed. The barricades must come down. But how is an open question. The Prime Minister was careful to spell out Ottawa is not directing police to act. Good. My name is Jason Charney. Good far enough. It's up to each police force to decide when and how to remove protesters. The RCMP in BC, provincial forces in both Ontario and Quebec. Trudeau also had a message for the chiefs who've been ignoring his call. Uh, the onus is now on Indigenous leadership uh, to end these barricades. Only the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs aren't taking that kindly. They have demands of their own. That the RCMP, RCMP are completely removed from our territory and cease patrols from our lands. Out means out. Plus a pause in pipeline construction before any talks can happen. For the opposition, Trudeau's response is days late and it falls short. Now he is relying on the goodwill of the protesters to take down the barricades. That's not leadership. And today some premiers renewed their calls for Ottawa to step in and coordinate police action. And so the wait for this to be over continues with the lines hardened on both sides. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Trudeau also faced criticism from Indigenous leaders. Some of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs took time today to thank Ontario Mohawks for their part in halting train traffic in a crucial rail corridor. Olivia Stevanovich was there for the reaction. After a day-long meeting, Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and Mohawks faced the cameras and criticized the Prime Minister's approach. Respect, trust, comes first. And if those two are not around, how can you come up with a dialogue? The hereditary chiefs have set preconditions for any dialogue. One construction stops on the natural gas pipeline during talks, and most important, that RCMP completely withdraw from their entire 22,000 square kilometer territory. Yesterday, the RCMP offered to pull back, but the chiefs say police harassment continued and every single officer has to go. This Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief dismissed the countrywide frustration caused by the blockade. They're just experiencing 14 days of it. I am 55 years old and I've been experiencing it for 55 years. 
you compare your 12 days to my 55 years, it's nothing in comparison. This Tyndanega elder worries about what could happen to her people if police move in. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. And I know that it, it could very well happen. You know, uh, it just takes a little more fuel to that fire in a not a good way, in a negative way, and boom, you could have a, it could be, yeah, disastrous. Hereditary chiefs say they have been assured by federal ministers that the RCMP exodus has started, but they'll be watching to make sure police follow through. Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Tyndanega, Ontario. And for some analysis on the government's moves today to end this stalemate, let's bring in our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton in Ottawa. Rosie, what has been the strategy on this? Well, obviously, Susan, it was to avoid where we are today. But if you look back at the week from when we first heard Justin Trudeau on Tuesday speak in a real substantive way about this, it has also been about trying to build up the political capital if the government ended up in the space we are today, which is the blockades are still there and there are no real talks. So th they managed to do that, which allowed uh, the prime minister to be able to say today in his press conference, listen, here are all the things that we have done over the past four days. We've reached out to opposition leaders. We've been talking to premiers. We've extended our hand using his words to the hereditary chief, to the Mohawk. And then what they thought was a really significant move yesterday, that decision by the, the RCMP in British Columbia to pull back from the Wet'suwet'en uh, uh, territory, maybe not as much as the hereditary chiefs wanted, but uh, something that the government thought w was going to shift things here, and, and it didn't really happen. All of those efforts to build up the credibility for the prime minister to say, we tried our very best. Now, what are the First Nations going to do to try and come and meet us down the road here? Clearly, though, you know, Trudeau has a lot riding on the outcome beyond solving this current crisis. What is at stake, do you think? A couple of things. I mean, the, the reconciliation agenda is certainly uh, under a lot of strain here. That's one of the government's top priorities. And if people are looking at this situation and see that the, the dialogue has completely shut down, uh, there may be less opportunity and, frankly, less goodwill on the part of all different communities inside Canada to allow that agenda, ambitious agenda, to move forward. And it's also a test of his leadership. It absolutely is that, too. He decided that this was the way that he wanted to approach uh, a crisis point. And we don't really know yet how this is going to unfold. They hope that the protesters will walk away. But if they don't and the injunctions do have to be enforced, what does that say about the way he approaches these kinds of conflicts? That, I think, the verdict is still uh, will, will come in in the next couple of days. Precisely. OK, thanks so much, Rosie. You bet. Another impasse today, this one between Ontario teachers and the province, culminating in a massive one-day walkout. Teachers and their supporters stage rallies today, hoping to put pressure on the provincial government over cuts to education. And while there were pickets across Ontario, the largest by far was at the government's front door. Sarah Levitt takes us there. No hips, no butts, no education cuts. Thousands filled the park outside Ontario's legislature. Teachers from the province's four biggest unions were on strike today, lobbying for a range of issues including better salaries and lower classroom sizes. We are educators! Lining a main thoroughfare in Mississauga, many more teachers. The Ford government is not listening and unfortunately they've pushed us to this point. The last time this many teachers were out of their classrooms in Ontario was 1997. We won't go back! That illegal strike lasted two weeks, but 20 years on, the issues are much the same. Again, it's a progressive conservative government making cuts to education. Currently, I have 32 students in my classroom. And what's that experience like right now? Well, right now, uh, it's a challenge getting to every kid. Uh, a lot of these kids have questions. and. You pack more and more students in that classroom, how many can I really get to? The government has shown flexibility on classroom sizes. Initially, they wanted to increase the average high school class size from 22 to 28. They're now offering 25. But neither side seems to want to budge over compensation. What's it going to take to find a solution to this? It's going to take, I think, everyone reaching out to their MPPs. We need everyone saying to the Ford government, enough is enough. They could have continued negotiating with us to get a deal, and I want to still do that. 
but they opted to interrupt that momentum. Unions have been holding rotating strikes since December, something that's frustrating some parents. It's difficult on the kids, you know. One day they're school, the other day it's not. We want, we want to be at work. work. Teachers and the government the agree students should be in school, just not at any cost. Unions representing Catholic and French teachers are at the table, but negotiations with the two biggest, representing public elementary and high schools, have stalled. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Toronto. Turning now to the global coronavirus outbreak, Chinese officials are confident they are making progress, but others fear a rapid spread outside that country. With sudden spikes in the Middle East, in Europe, and especially in South Korea, with almost 350 infections, 142 new ones today alone. Christine Barak takes a closer look. Another mild case of COVID-19 landing in BC isn't cause for alarm, but this traveler visited Iran. Experts say it's a sign something bigger might be happening. We didn't consider Iran as a place where there was transmission of COVID-19, so um, that set up uh, quite a number of warning bells for us. This latest Canadian case raises fears that the virus is spreading with dangerous speed, not just across Asia, but in countries no one expected. The cases we see in the rest of the world, although the numbers are small, but not linked to Wuhan or China, it's very worrisome. Just days ago, Iran wasn't reporting any cases of COVID-19. Now it has 18 and four deaths. The source of the infection is unknown, but China is one of Iran's biggest trading partners. This infectious disease specialist says Iran might have hundreds of cases. And the real question is, you know, how much disease burden is in Iran? And do they have the capacity to really get this under control? South Korea is also seeing a surge in patients reportedly linked to a church congregation. And a cluster of cases in northern Italy has now shut down schools and public events. At least 16 people are sick, including health workers. COVID-19 has now been detected in at least 31 countries outside of China. While the vast majority of cases involve travel from China, the virus is spreading. And we have to really be prepared for a possible scenario where there's more widespread transmission throughout the world. Canada's chief public health officer says there are no new travel advisories or additional screening questions at airports, but says travelers should be vigilant and let health authorities know if they've traveled to an affected country and are now having flu-like symptoms. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. It's been almost two months since the coronavirus epidemic started. A long, hard time for everyone who's been affected. But for hundreds of Canadians who spent two weeks in quarantine after being flown home from Wuhan, China, earlier this month, it's now all in the rearview mirror. Well, er Ellen Morrow shared their excitement today. Off the base and finally back to normal life. Feels like freedom. It <laughs> feels pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I think the first plan is to maybe get some uh, some nice food and then to relax Kinda a little go bit. Home. Yeah, go home, relax yeah. a little bit. Get this guy have a nice nap. Oh. Ashley Stad is a newlywed. I am so excited to see my husband. It's been a while. <laughs> so, I don't know about you. Yeah, I'm excited to go home. Um, it also feels weird to not be wearing a mask. Yeah. <laughs> Busloads of Canadians arrived at Pearson Airport from CFB Trenton, where they spent two weeks living in rooms like this one. How did you pass your time when you were in quarantine? Uh, we played a lot of cards. Did you? Yeah, with our um, roommates. So, played with cards and a lot of walking around. Not much else to do. A lot of Netflix. Others made their way off the base themselves. Megan Millward and her husband packing up the kids and a rental car for the four-hour drive to Montreal. I have an elderly mother and I wanted to come back to make sure that she was alright because we'd only been planning to be away for two weeks. Two weeks turned into five. When we got back the Canadian soil, we just feel really like a relief yeah. and feel well, we're, we know we're safe. But that relief is tempered by concern for their family in China. We hope that they remain safe 
and we hope that a vaccine comes out and that next year for Chinese New Year we'll be able to go back and celebrate properly. The silver lining of the quarantine, new friendships. Still, Miriam LaRouche can't wait to get home. I want to just hug like my family and my friends, just like to be able to give like proper hug. I think like I miss that, honestly. <laughs> she also missed double doubles, her first buy off the base. <laughs> How good does that taste? Even better than it was. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, like Toronto. Right now, like... And while those Canadians celebrate their freedom, those released from quarantine aboard the Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan now return to isolation. But at least it's here in Canada, and that ha fact alone has some of them smiling. Very happy and exciting. I spend enough time for doing no crime. <laughs> Alan and Diana Chow were among the 129 Canadians who touched down at CFB Trenton early this morning before being loaded onto buses to spend their 14-day quarantine in Cornwall, Ontario. And while it certainly won't be as punishing as it was on the ship, it is still isolation. So officials are providing extra support. These individuals have been you know, cooped up in a... In a uh crews and many of them without windows and so we are offering on-site mental health services. And as for those Canadians with coronavirus still in Japan, Ottawa says they'll be on their way home as soon as they've been cleared to travel. And we're learning about some of the economic costs of the coronavirus outbreak. Air travel demand has declined for the first time since the 2008 financial crisis. Lost airline revenues could total $29 billion, says the International Air Transport Association, with Chinese airlines bearing most of the brunt. Global air traffic has fallen off by almost 5% so far this year, with many carriers, including Air Canada, suspending their flights to China until at least the spring. Russia is actively interfering in another presidential election, according to U.S. intelligence officials. They say the Russians are trying to boost the campaigns of both Donald Trump and Democrat Bernie Sanders. As Katie Simpson tells us, some say Trump's reaction puts American national security at risk. Basking in the praise of his supporters, President Donald Trump brushed aside concern about the growing upheaval inside the U.S. intelligence no, community, instead I accusing Democrats of smearing him in an election year. You know, they're trying to start a rumor. It's disinformation. That's the only thing they're good at. Behind closed doors, the president is reportedly furious, angry that intelligence officials briefed lawmakers last week on new evidence showing Russia is trying to help the president get re-elected. But how is unclear. 24-7, the Russians have been striving to disrupt this election. The Kremlin denies the allegations, calling U.S. officials paranoid, though hours after that dismissal, Bernie Sanders revealed Russia is also trying to help his Democratic presidential campaign. And when I say to Mr. Putin, if elected president, trust me, you are not going to be interfering in American elections. If evidence of interference at this stage is unsettling, American lawmakers and security experts are also on edge over the president's reaction. After that intelligence briefing to lawmakers, Trump removed Joseph McGuire, the acting director of national intelligence. If intelligence analysts are, uh, there's a chilling effect from telling the truth, uh, our country is at risk. Replacing McGuire is the U.S. ambassador to Germany, a vocal Trump defender with zero experience in this domain. That's setting off alarm bells within the intelligence community. So I think they, they see this as portending even greater efforts on the part of Trump to put his loyalists in these positions so they can squelch the intelligence that really is necessary for national security. And that's why I said this is a crisis. While it may seem counterproductive that Russia is interfering in the campaigns of opposing candidates, it's all part of its overall goal to sow division and destabilize democracy. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Democratic presidential candidate Mike Bloomberg says he will release three women from confidential agreements that prevented them from talking about sexual harassment suits. None of them accused me of doing anything other than maybe they didn't like the joke I told. And let me just... Bloomberg. Let me 
has been reflecting on that issue since Wednesday night's Democratic debate, and he adds he's willing to release the women from the agreements if they contact his media company. A dramatic end today to the first week of jury deliberations at the Harvey Weinstein sexual assault trial. Jurors indicated they are deadlocked on the most serious charges against Weinstein, predatory sexual assault. And they asked the judge if they were hung on those charges, could they still return a unanimous verdict on one of the lesser charges, including rape and criminal sex act. The judge told them, keep deliberating. Our Stephen D'Souza has been following the trial and was in that court today. Steve, what does this mean for where the jury may be on a verdict? Well, we had the clear sense today of where they are in their deliberations, but just also how complicated their task is to prove predatory sexual assault. They have to believe the lesser charges related to Jessica Mann and Miriam Haley. And based on the question they asked today, it seems that they have reached a consensus on those. And it may be guilty on one or more of those charges because otherwise they wouldn't be considering the most serious charge. To prove predatory sexual assault, they also have to believe the testimony of the supporting witness, Annabella Shiora. And her testimony goes back, her accusations go back more than 25 years. And we know mm. they've had issues with that because it goes, you know, they've asked to see some of the emails related to her and also have some of her testimony read back. So what would this turn mean for Weinstein? Well, the prosecution has said they don't want a partial verdict. The defense has said they do, they are okay with a partial verdict because a partial verdict uh, means and lesser charges means lesser jail time anywhere from five years to no jail time at all uh, whereas a predatory sexual assault charge that brings life in prison Weinstein didn't really answer any questions today and his defense team looks a bit rattled as for the jury they get to go home for the weekend they're not sequestered they'll be back on Monday at 9 30 for their fifth day of deliberations as you will be Stephen D'Souza in New York tonight right. thank you you're welcome a mall north of Toronto seems to be full of unbelievable designer bargains, but hang on. Is this real? No, 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 everything on the review is all fake. Coming up, a marketplace investigation finds the fakes, why it's so hard to get them off the shelves. He's got it. Oh, 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 good oh. Shot. It's been four months since the tragic, sudden death of curler Ali Jenkins during childbirth. How the sport she loved is helping her family heal. Plus, a tearful plea that moved people around the world. I want someone to kill me. And the overwhelming response. We're back in two. International pressure from the outside, political unrest on the inside. Iran held its parliamentary elections today and early results could be in tomorrow. But as the CBC's Margaret Evans tells us, whether Iranians feel they can trust those results is the question. From behind the curtain, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei emerged to cast the first vote and appeal to people's piety. Voting is a religious duty, he said. But critics condemn today's vote as a fix, accusing the country's powerful Guardian Council of guaranteeing a hardline parliament by barring thousands of moderates from standing, including, says journalist Maziar Bahari, reformers from the last parliament. And some of them were disqualified just for a tweet, or some of them were disqualified just for certain words that they used in a lecture somewhere. And so, some disaffected voters have chosen not to cast a ballot. With the disqualification, says this man, the ones who could help a little can't get into parliament. Iran's leaders have played on patriotism, saying to vote is to send a message to the United States, still imposing sanctions on Iran. The message has its appeal. We come to vote. If you, if you don't want to come, we don't, nobody's going to force us. But the government is under pressure from within. In November, it put down huge demonstrations against rising fuel prices. Hundreds of protesters reported killed. And in January, after an Iranian missile hit the Ukrainian plane carrying so many Canadians, 
People on the streets chanted Khamenei is a murderer. The lies that the Iranian government uh, told the people, it really illustrated the true nature of this regime. A regime clearly determined with this election to consolidate its power even further. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. We're watching several other stories across Canada tonight, including some Nobel Prize winners calling on Ottawa to reject the Tech Frontier mine project. In an open letter to the Prime Minister, more than 40 laureates called the proposed mine in northern Alberta an affront to the state of climate emergency. Premier Jason Kenney disagrees. Tech has committed, by the way, to a net zero carbon uh, plan. I suspect these are facts that many of those signatories were not presented. A decision on the $20 billion project is expected by the end of the month. In Quebec, 21 people were injured when this ski lift came to a sudden stop. It happened at a resort just outside Quebec City. Operators were able to eventually restart the lift, allowing the skiers to get off and get checked for injuries. 12 people were sent to hospital. It's not clear what caused all this. Canada's privacy watchdog is investigating a controversial facial recognition technology. Clearview AI collects billions of images online to help police and financial institutions identify people. Toronto police admitted to using the technology but says officers have now been told to stop. Regulators will be digging into whether the company's practices comply with privacy laws. Well, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Why police are so determined to crack down on fake designer goods. And at the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, a powerful tribute to Canadian curler Ali Jenkins, who died giving birth just four months ago. Stay with us. Questions are being raised about the findings of a former Calgary medical examiner and whether they led to wrongful convictions. A provincial review of Dr. Evan Matches's work examined more than a dozen autopsies. A recent Fifth Estate investigation into that review prompted Alberta and BC to launch closed-door external probes into how prosecutors handled the controversy. Carolyn Dunn now on what could happen to the rest of his cases. Even after several years out of prison, Butch Chinake says he's still not free. If I tell the truth, nobody will believe me, right? Chinake's girlfriend, Charmaine Wesley, died in 2011. Dr. Evan Matches conducted the autopsy and stated she died from blunt head trauma inflicted by another person. Chinake was charged with second-degree murder, but rather than face life in prison, took a plea deal for manslaughter, even though he says he's innocent. And 10 months later, Alberta Justice got this expert opinion that in Chinake's case, homicide is not adequately supported. Chinake's lawyer, Adriano Ivanelli, insists he was never told of evidence that might have exonerated his client. They never gave me that disclosure. So, why didn't they? A sitting Alberta judge has taken the unusual step of weighing into the controversy, pointing the finger back at Chinake's defense. Gregory Lepp is the former head of Alberta's Crown Prosecution Service. In a letter to the Fifth Estate, Lepp says Ivanelli declined an offer of additional disclosure. Well, no one told me what that disclosure was to start off with. And more importantly, they knew. They had it. How can they not act upon it? They have a positive duty to correct uh, a miscarriage of justice. So they can't just sit back and do nothing. Judge Lepp says Alberta Justice made a public announcement that a review of Matches' work showed unreasonable findings in 13 of 14 cases. Therefore, it was obvious to Chinake's lawyer that Matches was unreliable in any criminal case studied by the review, and his opinions back then were useless to the prosecution. That raises another question. Should authorities take another look at other cases involving Dr. Matches's autopsies? You have to go back and, and look at all those cases again. In 2012, the review that found fault with those 13 cases was quashed in court after Alberta Justice agreed Dr. Matches wasn't given enough time to respond. But then, 
Alberta Justice abandoned a promise to conduct a second review, leaving all those questions about Dr. Matches and his autopsies in limbo. The only way to really get to the bottom of it is to have a public inquiry before a judge um, who has subpoena power and people are going to have to testify under oath in public. In the meantime, Dr. Matches continues to testify as a forensic pathologist across North America. He disputes the findings of the review panel, stands by his work, and claims he's the victim of a political vendetta. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Coming up, Scott Jenkins' biggest fear is that his late wife, Allie, will be forgotten. We pray to mom was trying to not let them forget. That's my biggest worry right now is them forgetting. Before her tragic death four months ago, she dreamed of making it to the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, how curlers there honored her. And later, why those fake luxury goods aren't a victimless crime if you follow the money. The Scotties Tournament of Hearts heads into the finals this weekend with Moose Jaw hosting some of the finest women curdlers in Canada. But it's a tough time for one man whose wife was on track to compete on that ice but never got to live that dream. A few months ago, Ali Jenkins died in a rare childbirth complication, leaving behind her husband and their three young children. Tragedy took Ali away from her family, but as Devin Haru explains, the sport that she loved is helping them heal. It was always his wife's dream they would watch her play here at the Scotties, the crown jewel of Canadian women's curling. Come, on, Come here, sweetie. Come here. But now, Scott Jenkins, his kids, Ali's teammates, stand at ice level because Allie Jenkins never will. All of a sudden it just, in a blink of an eye, everything just dropped. She had a seizure and they, all the machines were dinging and ringing and it was, it was, they grabbed me and I, I went out to the hallway and I collapsed and, and then, so they had nurses on me and, and then I just seen them take her away and it was just, uh, yeah. That was the last I seen her. Scott Jenkins' wife, Allie, was a mother of two excited to have a third child. Her family, the love of her life. Looks like it's more like back eight, back 12. Curling was her second love, and she was good at it, rising up the ranks to being a member of one of the province's top teams. But in the delivery room, on Scott's birthday, and what would be his daughter's too, the unthinkable happened. You don't ever think about losing your wife, like you go in there and you always feel like the kid's at risk, like that's, it is, it's the kid that's definitely most at risk when you find out how many moms actually do pass away from it. Allie died in the hospital that day only four months ago, the tragic outcome of an incredibly rare complication. I didn't get Sydney a bottle. Allie left Scott with four-year-old Brady, one-year-old Avery, and newborn baby Sydney, who survived against the odds, his miracle baby. What? Oh! I can't just curl up, I can't just lay in bed and sulk. I got three kids, so let's keep pushing. But it pains Scott to think they may forget her in a way he'll never be able to. There's so many videos from her Snapchats and, and all her stories and I'm trying to save them and, and pictures and we pray to mom just trying to not let them forget. That's my biggest worry right now is them forgetting. Right here. <coughs> yeah. He's got it. Oh, oh good oh, job. Oh. Way to go, Brady. Good job, buddy. Scott found a lifeline in a place Allie loved so much, where her teammates became her family. Allie last curled alongside Sherry Anderson and Nancy Martin 
and came within a shot of making it to the Scotties. They so badly wanted to get there for her and thought they might get another chance to do it. I think you saw probably on her faces when we lost last year. She was standing beside me and the tears were rolling and it was, uh, it was heartbreaking to lose that, that game, I think. And you always think there's another year. Allie's death sent a shockwave through the curling community, bringing them together in their grief. It's just, I mean, it's just not something you can wrap your head around. Not in 2019. Yeah. I think the one thing that blew me away was it was curlers, friends of friends of friends, curlers who didn't know Allie that reached out to us. And it really made me realize what a small community we have, really, that we all have each other's back and that we're all, like I said, teammates, whether we've played together or not, because we all do this, play this game that we love so much. <laughs> okay, let's hold on. It's why Scott's taking his family to Moose Jaw to watch this year's Scotties and be in the arena for a memorial honoring alley put on by Curling Canada. Scott and Allie did this same drive last time the tournament was in their home province. This time, so very different. Kind of excited to show the kids, but also a little, uh, a little sad and scared to enter the building, so. We're almost at the big rink, okay? Put your tube on. There we go, it's cold out here. Ooh. Go. Where is this building? This big building here. Me and mommy came here five years ago. Here, Scott is surrounded by people who loved Allie too. Team Ontario even has Allie's names on their brooms. Their skip, Rachel Holman, who gave birth to her first child just months before Sydney was born reached out to Scott in the days that followed Allie's death. Obviously emotional, yeah. <laughs> um, as a mom, you know, it's, it's hard to know that she's going to be um, without a mom, but it's amazing to see all the support and uh, everything that she has here. So you kind of get a bit of comfort in that. here on the ice, they'll always think of Allie and what she built for them in rinks like this. Mitch will now present honorary Team Saskatchewan jackets to Allie and Scott's three children. In some ways, still taking care of her family through the community she left behind. Devin Haru, CBC News, Moose Jaw. Wow, incredible tribute there. All right, coming up next, digging out from an enormous snowfall in Turkey. It's piled to the rooftops, and we'll show you more unbelievable pictures. But first. In case you missed it, a heartbreaking video posted by the mother of a nine-year-old Australian boy is shining a light on the devastating toll of bullying. And I want people to know, parents, Educators, teachers, this is the effect that Give bullying me a has. I'm gonna do it this is what bullying does. Quaden Bales was born with a condition causing dwarfism, and his mother says he's bullied on a daily basis. I want someone to kill me and you have me. And this is the impact bullying has on a nine-year-old kid that just wants to go to school, get an education, and have fun. Quaden's deep distress has triggered an avalanche of support, including messages from celebrities like Hugh Jackman. Quaden, you are stronger than you know, mate. And no matter what, you got a friend in me. And a GoFundMe page has raised thousands of dollars to send the family to Disneyland. 
they're overwhelmed by the response. He said it was going from the worst day of his life to the best day of his life. So I think that sums it up perfectly. An all too important lesson about bullying coming from the pain of a little boy and the power of a mother's love. Last night on The National, we showed you a marketplace investigation into the dangers of some counterfeit cosmetics sold online. Well, tonight, the marketplace team stops by a Toronto-area mall that's already seen a crackdown on counterfeit goods. But as Asha Tomlinson shows us, fakes can still be found there. Are these Manolo Blahniks real? I don't know. If you feel like you buy, you don't, you don't like no buy. We're undercover inside a popular shopping center known for counterfeits. Hello. Hi, how are you? Pacific Mall, north of Toronto. Check out these Valentinos. Six barrel. There are more than 400 shops. These are Valentinos. They're misspelled Valentinos. It's $60 for the spendy belt. And it doesn't take long to figure out that not everything here is authentic. Is this real? No, no, actually, everything on the view is all fake. But, but everything looks like the original one. Are you open? In fact, some say they're closing up shop okay. because it's illegal to sell fake products. We're going to close in 10 days. Do you know why they asked you to leave? They don't want us to stay here, selling those stuff. York Regional Police conducted raids and seized thousands in counterfeit merchandise back in 2018. Then summer 2019, they laid charges. Yet one day later, fakes all around. And now, not much has changed. Are any of these real? No. Pacific Mall tells us consumer health and safety is a top priority, and they believe the sale of counterfeits at their mall is extremely limited. They also say they issue warnings to store owners and work with manufacturers and local police to identify fakes. So a local crackdown here, but in the U.S., it's a national border priority. Officer Aaron Bowker gives us a behind-the-scenes look in Buffalo, New York. So this package seems to be clear. Yes, yeah, correct. Why is it so important for the U.S. to detect and seize these counterfeit goods? You have to consider where the money is going back to. It's going to, to fund external organizations, whether it's a terrorist organization, whether it's a criminal enterprise, it's funding something that's illegal. When you follow the money, it gets really scary. Um, that's what we're trying to stop. Over a three-year period, U.S. Customs and Border Protection seized more than 99,000 counterfeit shipments. What about Canada? Through an access to information request, we find out there have only been 69 detainments. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. You can watch Ash's full investigation on counterfeit goods on CBC Gem or at cbc.ca slash marketplace. We're following several other stories making news around the world tonight. <laughs> Afghanistan's president welcomed news of a week-long pause in hostilities between the U.S. and the Taliban. The two sides are preparing to sign a peace deal at the end of the month signaling a possible end to America's longest-running war. And a blizzard got people in this Turkish village digging out of 20 feet of snow. Residents were left without power and water. Schools there had been closed for three days. People managed to brave the cold today to clear some of the homes and the main roads. Heavy snowfall isolated a total of 70 villages in that region. The snow in Newfoundland has wrecked havoc with mail delivery. It's also delivered a note of irony for one St. John's senior. Our moment is up next. Mail delivery ground to a halt in parts of Newfoundland after that massive January blizzard. And once again, bad weather has gotten in the way. Sometimes with the snow, the mail carriers can't get up to people's doors. But curiously, a St. John senior received a hand-delivered letter informing him that he wouldn't be getting any more hand-delivered letters. That little bit of irony is our moment. I um, found the letter tucked into my front door mailbox, and it basically came from Canada Post. 
and it was a, a kind apologetic letter saying they were very sorry that due to weather conditions they could not deliver any mail by hand. The letter, however, was delivered by hand. The most important thing, I think, in their minds was the safety of the letter carriers, and that would, would of course, depend on the removal of snow. Although I respect entirely the need to protect them, I found that rather ironic, <laughs> that I, I got a letter saying they, they couldn't deliver mail, and they delivered it. Okay, it, is that true? Honestly, only in Newfoundland, you might say. That is our moment, perfect for a Friday for February 21st. That is the National. Thanks for being with us. Good night.